All right. So um, I'm just going to start our panel today. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome to our panel about ethics, AI, and the gender gap. We have together to, uh, with, uh, with us to get, I'm oh, sorry, we have today with us um, two amazing ladies who are doing a fantastic job in the AI field related to different, you know, industries that I'm going to let them to introduce, but it comes from design, um, art, painting, you know, um, and human-centered AI and everything. So we're going to go deeper in those topics. So I would like to invite first Avantika Mohapatra. Avantika, if I'm pronouncing your name. Um, You're fine. Know. So could you please introduce yourself, what you do, and um, yeah, so hi, and thank you once again for having me. So I'm Avantika, and currently I'm in Stockholm. I just graduated with a master's degree, actually. So currently I am leading uh, events and partnerships with AIX Design, which is a community that uh, people from AI, ML, and design backgrounds together. And we're constantly exploring different topics within this realm. So apart from that, I'm also releasing a tool that's coming up. It's called Designing for AI, and it's essentially a playbook that will help designers get on board with AI and how to create products and services that include human-centered AI. So, yeah. Mujan, you're on, Matt, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, happen, happen. <laughs> so um, yeah, please, Aisha, to Aisha to Guadabe. Please present yourself. Say what you do for our audience. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to uh, talk about this topic today. My name is Aisha to Guadabe, and I'm an, a visual AI artist. I'm a peace technologist, and the need to promote and co-create more equitable equitability within artificial intelligence really drives my passion. And I explore the interlink between language and technology, which has led me to focus on machine translation to break communication barriers. And I examine the digital from a social justice and transdisciplinary post-colonial perspective at the intersection of emerging technologies, peace building, art and design thinking. And my aim is to enhance Africa's current positioning in the world as the continent makes strides to become a more active participant in the realm of technology. So this is really um, the essence of uh, what, what I'm doing. I'm also currently supporting the peace process in Yemen, advising on digital approaches to peace using my practical experience in the field. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So, you know, I'm so fascinated by all your, you know, different, uh, <laughs> um, different backgrounds and experiences. So let's talk about now ethics and ethics in AI. Um, I would like to know your take on, um, on the definition of ethics in AI. How do you define it? And, um, what do you, what do you think of, you know, the, um, current actually you know uh, existing regulations or frameworks in ethics and ai do you, do you find you know anything that can um give us you know a certain understanding of like that let's say all of them have like this you know uh, seven principles of accountability you know um traceability and so on but what is your um let's maybe define uh, what is ethics and ai for our audience and then we can deep dive a little bit more into the topic uh avantika do you want to go first all right. So for me, like, I'm going to talk from a design point of view only so that I can, the rest of the talk, I can carry people forward with the design part of it as well. So for me, actually, when it comes to designing for AI ethics, it's super important. It is crucial to align the technology involved with the societal morals and values. So as we all know, ethics is embedded within society and dictates what is right and what is wrong. But to ensure that humans trust AI, it is essential to approach it from a transparent, uh, tra transparent standpoint so that users can always see what kind of data is being used and how. And like, like you said, we 
about data fairness, accountability, bias, all res re with respect to uh, AI and ethics. But from like an AI designer and developer point of view, it is super, super crucial to involve um, ethics from an holistic point of view so that we actually take an account of almost every kind of user, every kind of environment they will be in, all, almost every kind of data that will be used to create something that involves AI. Yeah, absolutely. And in a design is very important in any product, especially when it comes to um, designing products that are dealing in, you know, with data. You, it's very, very crucial to have a diverse team in, um, in those, you know, design, the bigger design team to make sure that we are really taking into account um, the needs of everyone and we are including everyone. So our product will not be biased. Uh, what about you, Aisha? What do you think about um, the topic of ethics and ethics in the yard? I think my perspective is particularly um, influenced by my post-colonial background. So uh, the question that I ask myself always is whose ethics are we talking about? Because we need to interrogate who, where do these discussions take place and by whom and with whom. And also, um, we have to look at how can we maybe look at different ways to conceptualize ethics that can help us have a totally different understanding. So AI systems we develop are normally embedded in worldviews. And if we would integrate indigenous or African uh, philosophies, then we would build totally different AI than we are building at the moment. Because ethics, as we know it right now, is very uh, much uh, rooted in Western-centric Western philosophies. So if you look at someone like Descartes, he says, I think therefore I am. So there is this kind of idea of AI as this rational entity, whereby if you look at indigenous um, cultures, they believe that even non-humans have a spirit. And if you look at AI as something that you cannot just use as an object, but as something that can help you uh, build community, then you will have a totally different relationship to it. So for instance, um, from an indigenous perspective, if you would build AI, you would build it to preserve community memory, for instance. Imagine building a chatbot that has um, all the knowledge of a balladeer and you could ask that chatbot uh, anything about your history and your culture. And it's a way of preserving also languages as you know, maybe a lot of languages are dying out at the moment. In Africa, you have 52 languages that have died out recently. So imagine if we would use NLP, natural language processing, as a way to preserve languages. So um, a point that Avantika made before is really important is we have to think about how do we design AI and um, how can we include a more global perspective so that we can ensure that also marginalized voices can um, can be uh, the facilitators of their processes, right? So I'm really interested in you know indigenous African perspectives. Also, if you look at um, there's this kind of concept in, in indigenous culture that there's this seventh generation stewardship. So every decision that you make you think seven generations in the future uh, ahead. So let's say you build something, you would ask your ancestors, um, your ancestors, you would ask the people in the future 140 years to ensure that you build something that's sustainable and doesn't harm nature. So um, I believe that we can learn a lot from these other cultures about ethics and enlarging also the concept and including other diverse voices. That's, that's actually, actually very beautiful what you said. It makes me think about um, how indigenous, uh, indigenous people are connected to the nature and thinking about, you know, the consequences of every decision they make than the modern, you know, human living in a city and 
it's you know obviously reflecting everything that we're doing today with regards to let's say the consequences of um our work with the climate change you know with with everything that we see uh it's impacting our nature so if it, it's like a philosophy for me when you're talking about it that way it makes me feel that um and that's also proven to that we need more people more diverse people in in uh, in the ai teams from let's say um backgrounds such as philosophy backgrounds such as you know art um more you know uh, different religions different um backgrounds different you know even you know indigenous people we have to get them involved in because I believe they are thinking a little bit <laughs> wiser and um, more long term than, um, let's say, sometimes the capitalist world, of course, right? So that's absolutely amazing what you shared. Um, I'm actually curious to know. Um, we're talking a lot about, for example, the problems that um, bias algorithms can make, um, problems that you know we have with unethical um, pro products, services made by AI, and it, it seems to be very hard, right? Um, when we say we're talking about bias in AI, it comes from um, um, non very um, clean or uh, not, not very um, um, proper database. So they don't include the data of all the people. They just include, let's say, for example, only data of white men. Um, and um, also the algorithms, they can also, you know, be biased, even though maybe you can have a really good database, sometimes algorithms can be biased. So we have these two elements in AI products that it can create um, a biased product or a biased application. And it seems very hard. Uh, why, do you, why do you think um, we're not getting there or, you know, what is stopping us? to really implement ethics in AI products and applications? So I think that this is a very human problem. And um, the reason why we're not able to get rid of uh, the ethical issues in AI is because humans are unable to trust AI systems at the moment. Because it, one key thing to remember is that AI actually uh, magnifies all the bias that is there uh, at the moment. And in many cases, for example, women face the brunt of it. So there was a recent Harvard uh, business publication uh, that said that, you know, bias is the machine, uh, machine learning's original sin. It's embedded in machine learning's essence that the system learns from data and thus prone to picking up human biases that the data represents. So for example, when I said it, women face the brunt of it, uh, there's a very interesting case study that was put forward by uh, the author of this book called, I think it was called um, Invisible Women. So where they say, uh, where the author was like, you know what, um, many seatbelts, headdress or airbags in cars, which have been designed mainly based on data collected by a car crash dummy, actually uh, are more favorable to men than women because women uh, might have, let's say a pregnant woman is not ta taken under consideration when you are of crash testing a car. So all the data that they have skewed and thus when it comes to actually implementing these AI systems in a car, uh, it's amplified and women are 47% more likely to be seriously injured and 17% more likely to, um, let's say, have a fatal incident in that point. Uh, so again, it's a very human problem because we're not able to clean the data or include all the biases or all, all the permutation combinations of different kind of people that might possibly use the algorithm. And that in turn also relates to trust because not everyone's comfortable in sharing the data. So we might not even have a holistic data set towards the end. Yeah, definitely. And um, let me also talk about the, what could we do in terms of, you know, um, solving the issue. So I was, for example, reading today an article, an interview uh, by Kay um, Butterfield, and she's basically head of AI ethics at, at World Economic Forum. And, um, and what was interesting in the article was that oh, what's the role of regulations here? 
So we're, we're talking about, let's say, EU is very ahead of their regulations um, um, related to the AI. Uh, and the interesting thing is that, um, and Kay was mentioning, is regulations are very, like laws are very um, slow in getting, you know, into practice. And it takes a lot of time, actually, something because from recommendation becomes an actual law. And the time that actually law has uh, is created and is now mandatory, the technology has passed over that already, or even they have changed or pivoted or it's not you know there anymore or it's too late so that's like you know the question is like how can we solve it and, um, regulations are maybe you know interesting to have something for facial recognition use of you know this data but um in general um maybe i i try to do you want to first like talk about the problem and then um having your uh, point on what could you do to solve this Okay, um, I would like to address a couple of points here. So first of all, uh, the question about bias. What is really important to notice that um, about 80% of AI professors are white male, for instance. And the industry also is dominated by men who then decide or design the data sets, right? So um, as Avantika said, bias is a human problem and it's not a technological one. So we have to look at the system uh, that is inherently biased and we cannot completely remove bias because it's a biological instinct um, that is programmed in our, in our way of um, deciding what is a threat, what is a, a, who is a friend, who is a foe, for instance. So um, there have been a lot of regulations and or attempts to make reg regulations, but I believe there has to be also a bottom-up movement. So um, people who do develop these data sets have to themselves um, look at their own situatedness and question themselves. For instance, um, I'm currently trying to develop a data set for African uh, languages. And um, there are a lot of really good guidelines of how you can ensure that your data is uh, responsibly sourced, how you can ensure that it is archived the correct way. And there are a lot of guidelines and I see a movement actually of uh, scientists really following, for instance, uh, this data, data sheet for data sets that has a, um, a set of questions that you can ask yourself in order to ensure that your data set is um, also um, ethical. So um, I think we have to take also individual responsibility and um, there has to be a bit more um, awareness raising so that people realize how much AI is part of our everyday life. So um, I think the pandemic also has shown how the gender gap is disproportionately uh, affecting women. So if you look at um, the effects of it, um, a lot of women are staying more at home and um, we need to address the gender inequalities that uh, are carried out disproportionately at the moment, such as um, at the institutional level, uh, that women need more support so that um, someone can take care of their children or for instance, um, at the household level, that there's some co kind of redistribution of care and uh, that we remove these kind of gender roles that uh, can allow for more equality. So I think we have to look at not only uh, regulations, but also at um, all the different aspects of society that have to play a role in order to change the way we uh, the way bias is being um, automated at the moment. Um, for instance, another example, um, I participated in an uh, ethical AI hackathon and uh, my team developed uh, an app against AI bias. Um, for instance, uh, maybe you know the Compass case. Um, there's a lot of problems in, uh, in prisons where you have recidiv recidivism um, algorithms that decide whether you will commit another crime or not in the future. 
And um, if you look at um, the data set, uh, you will realize that um, African Americans and indigenous people are weighted in a much higher way, which results uh, in them being scored as high risk more often than other races. So I think we have to look at, um, we have to make people aware that these things are happening um, in order to maybe create some kind of change that can come from the bottom. I really like the, what you mentioned that, that maybe we can have movements from a uh, bottom up. Um, so for example, um, there are communities of developers that they, um, they have, you know, the, this shared, you know, vision, values, um, manifesto that they promote, um, you know, following the ethical guidelines. And I know, for example, at Women AI, um, the organization that I, I have found that we have just started working on an ethical, um, ethics committee. So we are training our mentors, um, to be able to, um, um, you know, advise or uh, advise our uh, community to teach them also more about that and being able to um, have more women, not only um, as the consumer of this product, but as the creators of this product and those who are also setting up the lines for ethics and policy. So this is something important that, yeah, from the government side, of course, we can have, you know, some in a innovation or some, you know, regulation, but it's very important to have it bottom up as well, or even maybe more necessary. I think an important point here is that uh, now more than ever, uh, humans, uh, people like us, we're in touch with AI that use our voice, use what we are searching, um, and they have access to all of that. So given, um, given that the Sony issues already put forward by major tech companies about how these data is being used and the lack of transparency, it's more than necessary to actually establish these ethical communities, not just within a certain um, company, but also on a larger scale at, on a government level as well. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Actually, just uh, this uh, two hours ago, I was on another panel about the wiki gap. So the wiki gap is referred to the gap existing on Wikipedia. And what is this gap about is that um, about 80% of the contributors to Wikipedia are men and mostly, you know, white men. And uh, what it results is that we have so many portraits of leaders, of, you know, innovators, of um, very famous people uh, who are men because they were written mostly by men. And we were talking about it that actually uh, uh, there are organizations already doing it, but maybe we need more of them to have um, wiki atoms. So these are basically the sessions of, you know, uh, working, collaborative working together, sitting and correcting Wikipedia and adding, you know, more profiles of women on Wikipedia to show that, you know, um, that there are women who are role models, there are women who are doing great things. They're, they're just not seen because there's no media to, to show them. And... That was, you know, something I was really fascinated to see that how easily um, these uh, the biases are everywhere. And we as women, we are using those platforms that are biased. For example, Wikipedia is the, you know, the first place you want to know the history of something or somebody or some in initiative, initiative. And that's where you go and it's biased. You go to Google to search something that is, you know, biased. Uh, so these are the things that I believe that all of us should be accountable to to work on it. When you said like women are not seen, I think that just reminded me even in like, like we see like, for example, let's say Iron Man, we have all these like pop fiction about like how Iron Man and the Matrix and this all involved with AI and they're all men. However, when it comes to an equivalent uh, to that in women, there isn't any. Instead, uh, we have... Um, let's say the first chatbot or even like Siri or example, all the human arts that we created so far, they're all women. So which just makes me think like our 
the are just virtual assistants uh, where women are playing a key role? And if so, why is it only in the virtual world and not in the physical world? So that's just I would like to add to that as well that um, I find it really dangerous that we have these uh, voice assistants in a domestic setting where you can give them um, requests, you can ask them stuff. And imagine children growing up in a world where they're um, giving kind of orders to a female voice. Um, I find that... Uh, gruesome you know <laughs> and then uh, when i look at you know when you talked about women being Im invisible uh, i think about um bipoc women even being more invisible you know if you look at this um there's this uh, initiative called beauty ai and they did a beauty contest where a robot decided um who was the most beautiful and um out of the 44 winners, they were only they were all white people. So that should maybe make people think about you know what's what's wrong, you know. And I've read an article about um, a black woman uh, trying to train Teachable AI. This it's a Google um, app that you can use to train a model, and she tried to teach it to recognize her her um, pinky curly hair. And she trained it, but it still couldn't recognize it, you know. Or you have um, facial recognition software that has difficulty seeing black and brown faces. And you start to think about, you know, this problem is known. Why does it seem to be repeating itself? Why do the designers not learn out of these uh, issues? Or if you look at Zoom, you know, if you're a black and brown person and you want to use the background, it makes you disappear, you know anymore because I, I, it doesn't it doesn't see my face anymore so um it just makes you think why don't they have ai ethicists in their teams or why is it that they don't have an enough divide, diverse team in order to counter these kind of effects because it's it has negative effects also on 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 the trust that people have in their products so if if you have a company that's kind of the commodity that you want to uh, work on is the trust. How can you build trust in your product? But if you keep having negative headlines, people will, will continue to lose trust and especially women who could be customers, right? Yeah, that reinforces the point where I said, you know, you need to design for AI holistically. And as Mujin said, like you have to involve people from other backgrounds like philosophy and like sociology even linguists so that they identify different languages, for example, when you're, when you're doing like NLP and stuff. So. Yeah, I actually wanted to share something with you because I use this, I used to use it, um, now I don't because I use it a lot, but I use this um, example to show how biased we are already ourselves by, you know, one single question. And this is the, the dress, I, I'm sure most of you have heard about it. So if you click on the link I put, the Wikipedia, you click on it and you just tell me in the chat, what, what color do you see? Do you see the dress, white and um, uh, what is it, beige, like uh, gold, or you see it sort of blue? So the idea is that <laughs> this is just a bias in a human's eye. We all of us actually... Uh, okay, so uh, Anu says the golden one. <laughs> Blue for me. <laughs> Who sees it white? Oh, okay, Bruno, I'm like, uh, already, you see? <laughs> so me, for example, I see it also golden white. And this already shows that how biased we can be. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, Lily. <laughs> this is shows, like, how biased we can be ourselves. So imagine this is just for, you know, a little tiny bit um with you know with the same image and everything imagine that goes in very complex algorithms very complex cases and it can be dangerous and the 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 men and uh, the campus a uh, bias campus that um uh, you you mentioned it I should do is actually um for example that was in the case of the criminals um finding criminals or uh, predicting who's going to be who's going to commit a crime using UK, use also, I think, in the US, and it's a super, you know, biased case that was catching 
at people based on their looks and saying, okay, that person might commit a crime. And um, I don't know the percentage, but more than 80% of the people uh, were black men from a little bit, you know, maybe let's say underprivileged society because the stereotype is, okay, the people from this category, they um, they commit a crime, so we do it. But actually in the, the real case wasn't at all that. It were more like white men. And the beauty concept also, I... I definitely, um, I actually followed that too. <laughs> so that's one of the very, very um, biased cases. So we talked about all these biased um, examples and, you know, what is the danger in them? Um, what What is the thing that, you know, um, you have experienced yourself? Have you come across a real example of bias that you faced? Um, yourself um, in your work that it's impacted you or seen a product that it impacted you um, in a negative way? Um, in terms of bias, personally, no, not yet. Uh, but I'm sure as I keep working with AI, I feel like I'll come across it. But I think one of my major concerns right now is that the slight difference in opinion can lead to misinformation. And with AI being in the picture, that misinformation can be amplified and uh, gives birth to like fake images and videos and conversations. And we already have trouble believing everything we see here and read right now. So what happens when you no longer can tell if this image is real or this opinion is valid or something is AI generated? If Or if you're talking to a bot or a real person, because like unlike humans, Bots never tire working 24-7, so it can generate a vast amount of information and content based on that slight misinformation in a very short period of time. And once it's been shared over the internet and it goes viral, it's actually virtually unstoppable. So mm -hmm. I think that is, I wouldn't say like, I would say it's a threat and a fear that um, can come across with AI at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, I encourage everyone to join actually at um, womenai.co or become our members. Um, so I don't know if I said, but I'm the founder of Women AI. And what we have actually on our Slack for the community, we have a channel for bias, you know, and AI and ethics. So we constantly, you know, share from um, and uh, talk about, you know, different or new cases coming up. So I'm just going to put the link here for those of you who are interested in joining our community. But Aisha, do please go on. I think this is a really good question because it highlights that um, there are a lot of processes that are going on that we're not even aware of. So maybe AI has been biased towards us and we, will, we are not even aware of it. And that is the danger. Everything has been automated almost at the moment. Um, I personally haven't been aware of a big case where I've been uh, discriminated against yet, <laughs> but um, I would say that um, given that it is everywhere, let's say you want to get a new job and they're using an algorithm to sort out whether you're even considered or not, Maybe you heard about the case of Amazon. They, they used some kind of algorithm and trained it on the most successful CVs they could find. And obviously the top 500. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then of course they were surprised why did the algorithm sort out every CV that had the word women or anything related to females out of the, out of the, um, pack of CVs that were considered, you know, or um, even the way um, maybe people get rec, if you have even NLP, um, speech recognition software, maybe it is biased towards certain um, accents and it doesn't even recognize your voice and you try and try and try and it doesn't recognize you. And um, maybe one, case I could tell is um, even spell checking 
or auto correction is AI. So if you're writing a text, which happened to me when I was working as a peace builder in Benin, I was writing the names of places and the AI didn't recognize it because it wasn't part of the dictionary. It wasn't even part of the knowledge system of words, you know, I had to include it or it kept underlining, it kept showing me this doesn't exist, this is wrong. So I could say, yes, I experienced that when I when I write something um, that isn't part of the uh, vocabulary, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I want to actually give two examples that we all of us are experiencing without knowing. The first one is Sky Scanner. <laughs> you want to buy a ticket, it's not about like gender, but it's about, for example, where you're living. Uh, when I take to tickets from France, it's more expensive than when I take it in another country, European country. Um, I think no, um, Denmark or Norway is the cheapest one, by the way, for those who want to use it. <laughs> so that's one thing you pay more um, according to where you are. So um, this is, you know, I believe this is a, it goes into data privacy and well, I see where's, you know, the customer, um, but I'm using my data. So, <laughs> and the second thing is that Google ads for jobs. I don't know if they have fixed it or not, but um, if you search for a Google, uh, search for jobs, and then after a while, because of your cookies, you keep seeing, you know, jobs um, related to your research. And Google ads uh, used to show, and probably shows, still shows, um, more than a, it does show uh, jobs more than 200k uh, dollar salaries only to men. So if you're a woman, you never see that. So these are two like you know examples that we might not even notice, but we are discriminated. Um, Give one more example. Yeah, sure. So you know how when you go to the airport, you have these kind of body scanners, right? So. Yeah. I would like to highlight maybe uh, an example for people who um, who have a different kind of gender. Imagine you go through that and it only recognizes you whether you are male or female. And if you look maybe uh, female, but you still have um, male kind of organs, it will stop you and they will start searching you. So this is some kind of bias that can happen. Or even um, I heard from a friend uh, she went through the body scanner and um, it didn't recognize her because um, she was having an Afro and it is trained with a certain uh, data set that if you have an Afro, it will make a, a signal and it stops and the and, um, airport personnel starts to, to put the hand in, in the hair to check because the system alarms them. So these kind of trained models uh, can also increase this kind of form of discrimination. So we have to be aware that um, there are kind of biases out there that we don't experience on a daily basis, but that someone who doesn't comply to standards might experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, before our time finishes, because um, Avantika um, mentioned it, and I know that you you are working on human centric um, AI uh, products and services. And I wanted to ask you first to define what does it mean a human centric AI for our audience and then tell us a little bit more about it and anything exciting or anything related to the recent news you want to share you got, you know, with regards to ethics also. Please go. On. Um, so I want to, so I think just simply put it, it would be that AI is holistically, like human-centered AI is holistically designed uh, to address user needs. That's the simple uh, definition of it. But I think if you want to broaden it a little bit, that it refers to the attempts being made to bridge the gap between the principles of design and AI, because as AI continues to learn from humans, it demands an effective interaction between uh, the people that are in design and people that are using products and services that include AI. So additionally, this at this uh, moment, there's so much stigma around uh, AI, like what is AI, what is AI doing, how it is being used. So I think uh, human-centered AI plays a key role in kind of breaking that barrier uh, 
and to kind of also in, inform the users that, you know what, you are using this AI-driven product, but you can also be in control uh, of everything that you do with it, like for example, the data you provide and how you continue uh, feeding and what kind of information and stuff. And I think the key factor of the human-centered design of, uh, aspect of AI is that it's guiding intelligence, both um, human and AI, because the end goal of AI, which as, as of now, I see it as augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence would be when it completely replicates a human brain. So, so, so I think at this point, everything that AI does is kind of guiding both human and AI to kind of work together towards that goal. So developing systems that understand the social cultural aspect of human behavior, as well as systems that kind of align uh, with the human need at the least, make them feel safer and help them use products and services that involve AI. So at this, so I think, um, Current algorithms working in, uh, with AI must complement uh, human cognitive behavior, such as humans' interactions and language to kind of, like I said, break the barrier and make it usable on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, actually, we have our, from our audience, Lukna Dajani, who's mentioned that um, we look up IEEE standard um, which is a recommendation, recommended practice on the impact of AI on well-being and human happiness. Thank you so much, Dona. Thanks for sharing. Aisha, did you want to comment on the conversation? Um, maybe I would like to um, comment on what Avantika said first, because um, I actually believe that there needs to be a paradigm shift away from human-centered design. I believe we need to go towards a more environment-centered approach that um, centers interconnectedness and uh, interdependence of humans and the plants and the land and the water and the air. So I think that is really important and to go away from egocentric to ecocentric. And what I mean by that is that human-centered design um, centers the human. So it's very anthropocentric, and you can almost imagine it being the form of a uh, of a triangle with the human being on top. But ecocentric approaches um, are very much influenced by indigenous or African ways of being, and they see the world as being um, interconnected. And you can see it more like a circle with all beings being inside of it. And if you have such an approach, it can change also the way that you design um, that you design uh, AI. As I mentioned earlier, um, many indigenous cultures think about the seven years in the generation rule. And we could try to think about what does that mean for technology? Should we start to think about seven generations of technology? What would AI 7.0 look like? So um, I believe really that um, we can gain a lot from um, not only looking at the human needs, but also looking at how we, can we develop AI that doesn't harm the environment. Because if you look at language models, they need a lot of energy, like Google Translate. They need a lot of energy and they have a high carbon emissions. So how can we avoid developing AI that causes um, harm? to the environment. I think this is really important. So I think the way I see human-centered design is basically a bridge between society and people and not just uh, just the people itself, like just humans. So like just the way, you know, ex for example, engineering is the bridge between science and society. Human-centered design is kind of the bridge between society and people. So I think that kind of takes an account of, uh, let's see, environment and sustainability, basically the ecosystem of where your human and product are existing. So that's just the way I see it. So. Mm -hmm. I have a question actually on that. So when we say, for example, human-centered AI, does it mean that then it's on only human to tell AI what it wants um, or is the other way around? Because we have, for example, 
where the AI takes a decision, makes a decision, but that um, in order to have human centric AI, would it mean that it's on humans to control it and feed it? Yes, at this point, uh, like I said, the way I see AI right now is augmenting intelligence. Like it's basically helping humans make better decisions or faster decisions. Um, anything that helps in um, making sure that we can quicken a process without being, you know, like humans, like I said, tend to get tired. They're very bad at repetitive uh, tasks. So I think uh, having them, having AI systems complement their current working processes is what AI is good at right now. So at this point, I think it's just influencing decision-making uh, processes at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so we are actually 10 minutes left before at the end of our panel. Um, if there's any question from the audience, feel free to share it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to just ask a very like, you know, more personal question from each of you. Um, I know that, you know, Ashati, you, you are working on, um, I mean, like your background is from art, um, painting, you know, and you're basically connecting. Um, I, my question is like, how do you connect art, um, painting, photography with AI and what you do? Because, and also, you know, with regards to um, your work in uh, conducting peace um, in conflict areas. How do you see that all these are, you know, joining forces together? Because you have a very interesting profile. You're on mute. So thank you so much for this question. So for me, combining AI and art can be a very powerful medium to um, show non-traditional, non-Western views of personhood. So in my pieces of art, I, um, I look at the question of personhood and I try to um, interrogate how can I use AI and um, philosophy and um, get people thinking differently about um, what it means to be a human. So um, for instance, I've made one piece which is called African Epistemology. And there um, I'm using um, Gantz to, like I use photos or paintings, which are put through an algorithm uh, of Gantz to do its style transfer, uh, which means um, you have, for instance, a picture or a painting or photo you, you use a style picture, which is maybe a pattern that you create, and uh, you transfer the style onto the picture. And um, I use that method to um, change an image, which I then print out and then I paint over it again. So the, this painting, um, African Epistemology, uh, basically shows how um, is, is an interpretation of the African philosophy of Ubuntu, uh, where they say, um, I think, therefore we are. And what does that mean? Um, that we're all connected to everything. So you have in this painting, there's this woman, um, she's really big and she's part of the mountain, she's part of, of the earth. And I'm just trying to show how it's all connected. And there's some uh, script also to show it's a form of communication and um, beautiful. Can we see it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Can I share screens sure. here? You, in the, okay. the buttons below, you see a screen which is like a, which has a red line like that. If you press it, okay. Just one moment. I will share my screen now. But that's what I'm like so fascinated about um, indigenous, you know, um, cultures and science and um, knowledge because it's I feel it's very deep. So how do I share screen? Yeah, click on the screen yeah. on the below ah, the okay. pictures. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay. So let me see. Let me know if you can see. So these are some of my paintings. I'm going to put my website also if you want to have a look. This is called African Fulani Woman. Um, but the painting I was talking about is this one. Oh, wow. You see? It's epistemolo epistemology from an African perspective aiming to depict black consciousness and ways of knowing. So, um, yeah, this is one of my paintings. I'll put maybe my website on. Yeah, sure. uh, my that is beautiful. Do it. <laughs> <It's really nice. laughs> and basically, I try to um, make people think a bit about um, different cultures by using AI tools. Um, and you're talking also about peace. Um, this is really uh, one of the things I focus on all my life, really. How can I promote peace? How can I... Um, amplify marginalized voices. And there I also use creative tech. So I'm developing basically um, games, computer games for peace. I'm developing um, soap operas for peace that have like peaceful messages um, with, local, with the local population in Yemen at the moment. Um, and really developing localized solutions for peace. And I think AI has a really huge potential for AI when it comes to AI for good and also when it comes to helping to solve uh, the most urgent human uh, issues that are out there right now. So um, imagine using it uh, to combat climate change. It's possible. You can use it to predict conflict. You could use it um, to identify hotspots of conflict. And... Um, it doesn't even mean that you have to use the highest uh, complex technology to develop it, but you could even develop, um, localize it and find locals, local conflict prevention um, mechanisms that exist and um, augment it just a little bit. So it doesn't mean inventing something from scratch, but AI can be there to, um, to help people um, better um, serve their communities. So um, I've been experimenting with that or working on that mm -hmm. a lot. And um, it's, it's very rewarding to see that AI can also be used in such a positive way. And in the peace building community, we have our own principles, we call it do no harm. So everything that we do, we have to, it has to go through loops of do no harm assessments in order to make sure that whatever we develop doesn't cause more harm. And also um, to make sure that um, even if we work with tech companies, that um, what we develop doesn't have any unintended uh, consequences. Like uh, Avantika mentioned, or I think you mentioned it with, um, um, with fake news. This is a huge problem in many developing countries or uh, the fact that um, you could have uh, a deep fake and that could influence uh, elections. So we have to be really careful. And these things are more accessible these days. Um, people have difficulties even differentiating between what's real and what's, what's, uh, what's digital. You know, um, if you look at NVIDIA, they're trying to develop a new kind of um, tool like Zoom. But the danger is that you could actually develop um, a generate a person that doesn't exist with that tool. And uh, of course, you could use it maybe in a setting where for schools or something. But imagine you're talking to someone and you don't know that it's not a real person. It could be used by radical groups to recruit. It could be used for good also in order to, when there's no, not enough teachers, to teach children via the internet. So technology in itself is not bad. It's just the way we use it or the way we design it mm -hmm. can make it dangerous. That's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, so we have uh, two minutes left, two minutes left um, from our panel. Um, um, from our panel. Uh, and maybe we can hear from you last words, Avantika, what do you 
uh, want to share with our audience. And I just see a message from Lily who wants to join us for two minutes afterwards. So please go ahead. Well, um, my journey was kind of a, a bit different. I went from engineering to design, and now I'm somehow trying to integrate design and engineering and AI and somehow use that for social good. And I think that's where Aishatu and I uh, really connected on is like using AI for social good. So I'm just trying to take everything that I've learned, for example, Engineers know how to make complex machines, regardless of how you could use them. And what I understood was that while while the engineers are uh, concerned with building these complex machines, the designers, on the other hand, take these complex systems and present it to the users in the most beautiful, simple, usable ways. And that, I think, in the realm of tech and AI could prove beneficial to unite people and not and embrace tech and learn how to actually not be afraid of AI, but to rather actually go hand in hand and see what good can come out of it. So that's where I stand at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you, Avantika, Aisha, too, for this amazing conversation. I learned personally so much about um, design and AI and peace and AI and um, art and AI and everything. So thank you for sharing your knowledge, your stories with our audience. And um, please share the links, you know, where people can contact you or see your work in the chat. Um, so, you know, we can make sure that um, who those who are interested in your work, they can follow you. And I just want to invite uh, Lily, if you, you you need to jump on the session, you're welcome now. All right. So do you, is there anything else you want to share? Any links, any more things before we close the session? No, but thank you so much for having us. This has uh, been really nice. Yeah, yes, thank you so much. much. This was a really nice conversation. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining, both of you. Um, I'm very, very, you know, uh, fascinated by both of your works. It's, you know, um, and thanks to Margaret who actually connected us. So <laughs> let's continue staying in touch and um, Maybe we can do some collaborative work together. So everyone, the, all the links are in the section. If you need to contact any of us, you're more than free. And um, thank you for everything. So all the best and happy Women's Day. Thank you. You too. Have a good day. Happy Women's Day. Bye.